everyone. Welcome to Your Story is Fish Kill Story. It's a community archive that we are going to be handling here at the library where we interview residents who have lived in Fishkill either their whole lives or a significant amount of time and are kind enough to share their stories with us. Today I'm honored to be here with Willa Skinner. She is a Fishkill historian and also an author. So Willa, thank you so much for being here with us today. Now have you always lived in Fishkill? No, I have not always lived in Fishkill. I came up here when I first got married, and I came up here from the Bronx. But I really had the best of two worlds because I spent my childhood up here. And I spent my summers up here. And my grandparents owned a place in Fishkill, and we called it the summer place. And we used to come up here and swim and swim in Fishkill Creek and things like that. And then in the fall, we would go back to the city. So I, yes, uh, so I lived in the Bronx and I spent my summers up here in Fishkill. And now, what was your earliest memories of the summers when you spent your childhood in Fishkill? Walking down on a dirt road <laughs> uh, to get to the creek. Uh -huh. <clears throat> and uh, we got down to the, what we call the old swimming hole. It was right down the road here. <laughs> And uh, we, uh, we went barefoot uh, crossing the railroad tracks, and there was the best, oh, that really good swimming hole. We did this until the war years. And then, uh, say, all the boys from Beacon used to walk upstream <laughs> to get to this swimming hole. <laughs> and then the war came, and the boys disappeared. What is Fishkill known for? Is it famous for anything in particular? Oh, yes. Fishkill, the town of Fishkill now, it really was among the early birthplaces of this nation. It was mostly, when we came up here, it was mostly farms. Uh, you took your milk can, a two-quart can, a three-quart can, and a four-quart. <laughs> <clears throat> and it filled up uh, with milk straight from the cow. When I was a little girl, the farmers used to get together after their chores were done. No one voted for Roosevelt in 1936. <laughs> they, uh, they did not like Roosevelt. And I remember my father talking about a neighboring farmer, and my father said, do you know what he's going to do? He's going to vote for Roosevelt. <laughs> Now, why were they not fans of Roosevelt? Roosevelt was a liberal. <laughs> oh, my gosh, he would be conservative today, but no. <laughs> now, what was the style of house that you first moved into? Oh, I mean, my parents' house? Yes. And it was farmhouse. I guess they would call it farmhouse style. No particular style, but they call it farmhouse style. That's what the real estate people would call it today. <laughs> we had a coal stove and a wood stove, uh, um, but for the electricity, we wanted to read at night. <laughs> we got tired of reading by kerosene lamps. And my family uh, was the first family to get electricity in their neighborhood. Wow. I guess being city people, they, <laughs> they didn't want to bother going out to the outhouse anymore. <laughs> What year was that in that they first? 1930. Were all the neighbors jealous? Did they come over? It, was, it must have been. Oh, they came back. over. They, they were curious because they saw lights on at night and they thought we had a sick cow in the barn. <laughs> now, correct me if I'm wrong, but has Fishkill, was Fishkill the capital of New York State at one point? You're right, yes. During the Revolution, Fishkill was the capital of New York State, and that is way back during the Revolutionary War. When the Supply Depot, I mean, you'll hear so much about the Supply Depot now, uh, during the Revolution, <clears throat> when the Supply Depot had set up here in Fishkill, uh, Fishkill was the capital of New York State, but just for a very tiny while. Now, who was the first mayor of Fishkill? Oh, you'll pardon me. 
and if I can't remember, Henry Du Bois Van Wyck. <laughs> is it true that Fishkill had the first post office in New York? Yes, it is true. If I only had the Revolutionary War map, I would show it to you. Now, when did the population change in Fishkill? Did it have to do with um, the events that happened after 9-11, or did it have to do with employers moving in and yes. out? Yes, it was a, I don't know if you know how the governments of the villages and towns are set up, uh, but it was a fourth-class town. In a fourth-class town, your judges serve both the village board and the town board. And in, I remember, I can't remember the year, uh, but when, the year it went from fourth class town to first, first class. That was quite a year. And the, uh, the makeup of the town board would change too. In the mm -hmm. late 50s, 60s, almost into 1970s, uh, the crowd, the commuting crowd you would see uh, on, on the way home and on the way to work was from Texaco and uh, IBM. So that's what brought our newcomers in. Do you remember when the first McDonald's came to Fishkill to Dutchess County? The first what? The first McDonald's. Was that a big event when that happened? Uh... To me, it wasn't. <laughs> Maybe it's just <laughs> some of the younger generation. <laughs> sure, sure. Now, what happened? Has 84 always been a highway that went through Fishkill? Is that something that changed the area at all? Well, when 84 came through, uh, the Van Wyck House was threatened, and the New York State was, it was in the path of uh, 84, and New York State was going to have it torn down. <clears throat> That is when uh, we, the, the public uh, got in sense and we formed the Fishkill Historical Society. There had never been a historical society before. And all of the, well, I could say a lot of the newcomers formed the uh, society. I like to give myself credit for that sure. because another member and I, her name was Barbara Boz, and we were on the Restoration Committee, and we decided to go to Albany to speak with the Transportation Department. You can't do that today. Well, we went to Albany when we sat down with all the heads of government, and we pleaded our case, asked them if the house could be saved. Well, we went to the office of the um, Bir J. Birch McMoran, his name was, and... <clears throat> We stopped at his office, but he wasn't in. Uh, so when we went back home, uh, we got a call from H. Birch McMoran, director of the New York State Department of Transportation. And he said, what is all this, uh, all this fuss about that old house down there? I'm coming down tomorrow and I'm doing a, an inspection. I have to come down to make an inspection of one of the highways down there, and I'll meet you down there. Well, we did meet Chad. Mr. McMorin uh, came up, and he came in his chauffeur-driven car. The license plate was NY2. The governor is NY1. <laughs> And he took a tour of the, this derelict of a house. It, it's the house that the, the only remaining absolutely uh, authentic uh, piece of uh, housing that was there during the revolution. Uh, the next day or two days later, we received a phone call from Mr. McMoran's office. The house is saved. It's been it's been taken from the drawing board. Today, the house is owned by the Fishkill Historical Society, and it's a public museum open to the public. Oh, yes. George Washington didn't sleep there. That's oh, okay. one place in Fishkill. No, he, he didn't sleep there. <clears throat> when he came to Fishkill, <clears throat> naturally, when, they, when <clears throat> the commanding general uh, comes, you give him the best quarters so he stayed at the house of Colonel Brinkerhoff, which is still standing, of course. And Lafayette was there, too. 
Now, Willa, has anyone famous ever lived in Fishkill? Anyone famous? <clears throat> no, but there were people stopped here. For example, the story begins with Mr. Krug. I can't remember his first name. Raymond Krug owned a house in, uh, in the town of Wappinger on Osborne Hill Road at the bottom of the hill. And <clears throat> he, uh, he owned a restaurant in New York City. And occasional, the occasional visitor to the restaurant was Frank Sinatra. One, day, one night, Mr. Krug was cleaning up, and he said to Frank Sinatra, uh, I'm sorry, but I've got to close up because I have to catch a late train to Beacon. <clears throat> Mr. Krug, I guess he didn't drive. He uh, traveled by train, and there was a late train to Beacon, so Frank Sinatra said, uh, well, where do you have to go? I'll drive you. Mr. Krug accepted Frank Sinatra drove him home, and it was so late at night, Mrs. Krug invited Frank Sinatra to stay the night. Well, he, he did. <clears throat> and uh, he left, the, as far as I know from the story, he left uh, early the next morning. Don't you think our party line was busy? The phone, we were on a party line. <laughs> if you don't know what a party line is, look it up. What is your favorite place in Fishkill to go to, or your favorite um, space or historical monument? My favorite place would be uh, Van Wyck Hall, uh, because that's where the Declaration of Independence is read every year without let up. It's a continuous, uh, <clears throat> continuous program. The Declaration has been read um, as I said before, uh, every year since 1902, without break. Uh, <clears throat> the citizens who really kept up, kept that up, was um, our businesswoman, Mary Bogardus, and our uh, former, uh, former mayor, uh, Mayor Sarah Taylor. Henry Du Bois Van Wyck, who was the first mayor, was a very patriotic man. In fact, he traveled to the gold fields of California in the, he followed the gold rush of 49. Uh, uh, he did not make his money digging for gold. He made his money as a jeweler and he made watches, things like watches for the miners, for those who struck it rich. So uh, Henry Du Bois Van Wyck uh, really struck it rich too, which I, I can't remember uh, which uh, uh, industry he invested in, uh, but he built Van Wyck Hall as a theater. Uh, he always meant to donate it to the village, but he died before doing so. And, and in 1902, his heirs got together and decided to uh, donate the hall uh, themselves. And they said, uh, since their uncle, um, Uncle Henry Du Bois, <laughs> was such a patriotic man, uh, they decided that maybe it would be nice if they could read the Declaration of Independence every year. And it has continued uh, every year since then during wartime, uh, no one showed up to hear the declaration uh, being read. And Mary Bogardus and uh, Sarah Taylor showed up on the steps and uh, the, the door to the hall was locked. So they stood outside in the rain with the rain uh, dripping down and read the declaration just to keep it up, uh, just to keep up the tradition. So a lot of people were devoted to and keeping the only one for an audience was Mrs. Taylor's little dog. <laughs> Today, it really it attracts a hundred people. Really, yeah. Oh, yeah that's wonderful. Wow. One year, Pete Seeger read it. Really? Mm -hmm. Oh, so it, so yearly it changes who's going to read it. How do they select who gets to read it? Is it volunteers or volunteers? Oh, yeah. That's very yeah. Nice. Wow. Have you read it, Willa? Yes, I have. Oh, you have. Wow. It was quite a privilege. That is incredible. Yeah. 
Well, thank you so much. It's unfortunately all the time that we have today. Willa, it's been an honor having you come and chat with us. It's been wonderful hearing about your stories. So thank you so much for coming. My pleasure. And I wanted to thank the, uh, the staff of the Blodgett Memorial Library, too, for all that they do and, and how they're handling this pandemic. And keep up, keep up your circulation. That's wonderful. And if you'll all tune in next time for the next episode of Your Story is Fish Kill Story, we're excited to continue on with the Community Archive. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Mm -hmm.